of my week. <laughs> because that's kind of what has happened over the years as um, I, I still work a full-time job and, and minister here and help run the church. I think my favorite thing of all is what we did a little earlier, lead in worship. <laughs> and uh, that just sits kind of in the middle of all of the complicated things that are involved on both sides of my life. Because ministry can be very complicated and stock market can be very complicated. And something about getting that guitar and starting to worship doesn't matter if anybody's here or not, just one-on-one, -on -one, you know, just you and the Lord. Something about worship that just shifts the atmosphere, right? So whenever you're having a difficult time, you know, King David drove off the evil spirit with what? With the anointing. It broke the yoke on Saul's life. And it can happen for you too. It's amazing what worship will do. Even if you don't play the guitar, it doesn't matter. There's so much great worship music right on your phone. You could pull up more worship than you could ever even listen to. It's right at your fingertips. So don't let the enemy harass you. Amen? You stay tuned into what the Word says. So if you just look in your bullet and pull out um, a little form, that'll help. There's a, a graph in there that I gave you that will help me get through the picture that I want to share with you before we look at some of the scriptures. And I'll say, you know, we certainly made a lot of noise during worship, and, and that's not because we're trying to make noise. It's because we're excited. Yeah. If there's ever a day in the calendar of the Christian year for you to be excited, it's today. <laughs> It's the Resurrection Sunday. And we keep saying Passover and Easter, they're interchangeable biblically because, you know, and it just so happened that it falls at the same exact time this year on the Hebrew calendar and our calendar. Uh, it doesn't always work out that way, but it's a, it's a beautiful thing that they were having the Passover meal. Jesus at the Last Supper, that was a Passover meal. And he bowed down and washed the disciples' feet as we show you here with this uh, statue that we have. That was right at the Last Supper. It's one of the very last things he did for the apostles was to wash their feet. And he said, I want you to do as I have done for you. I'm setting an example for you. I'm not going to be with you much longer, but this is, this is the love. I'm a king, but I'm a servant king. Yes. How many would like to serve under servant kings? <laughs> yeah, but that means you have to be one too. Amen. Not so easy. But that's how, that's how Jesus works. So you gain authority by serving other people. You get an access into their lives because you're willing to lay down your life, just like he was willing to lay down his life for us. We lay down our lives for him. And, and it's amazing how the anointing will break the yoke. When you're serving other people, you gain authority in their lives. It, we just heard it about the, the, the testimony of a coworker, And one coworker gets an answer prayer, and the other one says, oh, yeah, she prayed for me too. And it's like, yeah, it works. Something about what she does is different. It's the anointing of the Lord. We're willing to serve other people, and then the authority comes in. I just love that. All right, so what does it say at the top of that handout that you have in your bulletin? You see, you see it? That's a real biblical phrase for this Sunday, isn't it? It is finished. So that would have been Friday night when Jesus was hanging on the cross, and he said, it is finished. And there's just so many ways we could tie back that expression, but I'm going to try to give you my version of it for today. And I'm sorry if I'm repeating a little bit of what I said a couple of weeks ago, but you know, the Word of God is so powerful, it bears repeating, and sometimes we need to see it in a picture. And we were, as, as I mentioned earlier, I was with Trisha down at Glory of Zion. She had just gotten back from her trip with Chuck Pierce and his team to Zambia and South Africa on Monday. She came home, and then we were back on the road Thursday to go down to Texas. And uh, there was just a rich atmosphere of faith. Every speaker was bringing forth a really powerful word. You can go on the Glory of Zion website, and you can see the worship and the, uh, and the preaching. And each session just had its own anointing. And I'm used to being the one up here <laughs> looking at this view, but it was really nice to be sitting on a Thursday night, all day Friday, and most of the day Saturday, where you're sitting, and just be able to get my cup full and running over. Isn't that awesome? That, that's how the Lord does it, right? He fills us up so that we can go out and pour ourselves out <laughs> onto other people. And you get more by giving, right? So the, filler you, the more full you get, the more you give out, the more he has room to fill you back up again. So um, does he speak to you in pictures? I don't know if everybody's like that. But for me, it's probably due to that phrase, a picture's worth what? Isn't that cool? And what's a video worth? <laughs> Got to be more than a picture, right? A video has got to be worth a million words, easy, if a picture's worth a thousand. So that's how God will speak to us sometimes. He'll show us pictures. I was on the prayer ministry uh, uh, during one part of the service on Friday afternoon. They, just like we do here, they had 
people come up, and there were 1,800 people at this event that we were at. So there was, I don't know how many, maybe 100 or 200 prayer ministry people. And, and the lines were just forming in front of uh, each of the two, two man teams, or two woman teams. And uh, I was with a guy named Tobias, the bass player at Glory of Zion. I don't know if you know him. He's a young guy with tattoos all over the place. And he's a young guy. And he just has like a permanent smile tattooed on his face, it seems. <laughs> Like he's always in a good mood, even when he's playing bass. You know, like you can just see him grooving with the Lord, and he's just very prophetic. So that's a dream when you're on a prayer ministry team. Because in the, in the environment of Gloria Zion, the people don't come up and say, here's what I need prayer for. They want you to be prophetic enough to know what they need prayer for <laughs> and to say, this is what the Lord has shown me about your situation. So he would get started prophesying over people, and then the Lord would give me a picture. And it, I, I've never gotten, this has happened to me for years, and I've never gotten the same picture for two people. And, you know, it's scary because, you know, you're thinking, oh, yeah, I have to perform. No, you don't have to perform. You're in covenant relationship with God. He loves you. He loves this person who wants prayer. So why wouldn't he give you a picture or a word or whatever they need? That's what you're doing. You're just a conduit. You're in between heaven and earth. And he's pouring himself through you. And you don't have to say, I hope this means something to you. Or you don't have to try to condition it all. It's just like, this is what the Lord showed me while he was praying. And then over and over again, people would be, you know, taken aback by, wow, that's, that's what I needed to hear. And that's so cool yeah. that God could just use anybody at any time if you're open to hear what they have to say. But when it was my time to just sit and watch, I just kept seeing a big circle swirling around the center of the altar down there. And they have a beautiful altar, if you've ever been there. The building's 250,000 square feet. Just for comparison, this building's 23,000 square feet. So it's more than 10 times bigger. They have a huge sanctuary that they're building, but even in, in the smaller one that we were in held 1,800 people that, while we were there. And I had a sh uh, chance to lead worship for one of the sessions also. So I was up on the altar seeing 1,800 people all, you know, like all fired up, right? Because it was a conference. They were blocking out the time. They were investing their money. They were all excited. So there's just something happens. The atmosphere just gets charged with belief for the supernatural. And I, you know, I just got used to it a while ago that the Lord will just start to show me stuff. And I press in as he's showing me. So that's what I'm going to try to share with you. It was like a clock. And that's why you see this center picture on there. doesn't have the numbers on there because it's God's view of a clock. You're looking from behind the face of the clock. You see how there's those little pictures on the bottom? So the numbers are on the other side. But I'm going to start up at the top there at 12.01. What does it say? Three. All right, so just to see if you know how to tell time, what does it say at 8 o'clock? Good job. How about 5 o'clock? Good job. How about six? That's a little harder. Yeah, that's the bottom. All right, so you guys pick up fast. See, you're getting that picture thing going. And, you know, God doesn't think in a linear timeline. He thinks in circles. And that's why over and over in the Bible you see about times and seasons, and seven is a big number. Why? Because it's the end of a cycle. And you're supposed to go to Sabbath rest at the end of the sixth day, and you rest on the seventh day. Don't forget that. That's a commandment. That's not a suggestion, right? That's a commandment. And then at the end of seven sevens, you get a jubilee. And in that 50 year, you get a jubilee year because it's the end of another cycle. And the months are cycles. And wow, it's just awesome how that works. So God wouldn't, wouldn't be surprising to hear him say, I'm showing you something here. Hang in there with me. I want to show it to you. Now, whether I convey to you what he showed to me, you guys will have to be the determination of that. But, what, you know, we're going to start the clock at 12.01. And tell me again what it says on, on the graph. It says creation. Okay, so that was when God spoke. And it's pretty amazing what they're finding out about the universe right now, isn't it? Any of you follow this stuff? That the more they put the Hubble telescope up into the atmosphere, the more they're finding out that the universe is expanding. <laughs> I can't get my ar arms, my head, I can't get anything around it. Because what is it expanding into? <laughs> if you got that figured out, let me know. You can tell me after service. So like there was an explosion, this is what the world would say, there was this big bang thing. 
So not only are all of our planets revolving around the sun, but the whole thing is moving together in sync. Like, it's moving forward. It's going out further. Like, all right, I'm not a scientist. Obviously, you can figure that out. So creation happens, and it sets, the, sets life into motion. And then it says at 1 o'clock on the, on the clock, who do we find? Adam and Eve. And that was our parents. How many are going to meet them in heaven and have a few things to say to them when you meet them? <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Because God will say, Jesus will be right there saying, you would have done the same thing. <laughs> and don't be blaming Eve, because Adam should have been watching after his wife. And if he had been in the garden with her, that snake wouldn't have had a chance. Right? So the men have to take, you know, you want to take all the, like, you love that verse that says, women submit to men. And she could say, you got to love me the way Jesus loved the church. I think it's easy for a woman to submit to a man if he's loving her the way Jesus loved the church. How's that? It's Ephesians chapter 5. That's a freebie. <laughs> man. So we get Adam and Eve, and they're in this perfect relationship in the garden. And, I, and, and in my clock picture that the Lord gave me, that was on this side. It was the garden. And the cross is in the middle here, right? And, and then all of a sudden, the first element of warfare creeps in. And, you know, you hear atheists talking about this, and uh, there, there's a whole lot right now in the atmosphere, YouTube, people, you know, are more secular now than ever in America, right? So you have all these famous people writing books about religion is just fantasy and all. Let me tell you, we have the brightest people on our team <laughs> of all. For history, it's always been this way that Christians were the ones who came up with the idea of a university. They were, they were seminaries. Harvard was a seminary. You can go on the campus and it's right in the stone. All scriptures are up in there. And they want to get away from that now, but you can't because he's the creator of truth. So we, we've, you go through history, you could study this out on your own. But the thing is, they think this is all a, a fairy tale, right? They think it's all symbolism, but we don't. We think it really happened, that God created Adam. And, and he created him out of dirt, right? So just out of the dust of the ground, he creates Adam. And then he breathes into that dirt, and, and Adam comes alive. And how many of you have the breath of God in you right now? Amen. And then one of the advantages we have is that it's also empowered by the Holy Spirit. Anybody here not have Holy Spirit power in your life? Because if you don't, we want you to get it. Amen. Those of you that have Holy Spirit, don't you want them to get it? Amen. Wasn't that a game changer in your life? When you sense the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a divine energy that comes in us that gives us the ability to do things we could not have done without it. And you can't have it unless you say Jesus is Lord. You have to just not only bow your knee physically, but you have to tear your heart. You have to red your heart and say, Lord, I give you my life. You are the Lord of my life. And when you do that, he fills you with his power. And now all of a sudden, the things of the world grow strangely dim, don't they? in the light of his glory. And you don't want to go back to the counterfeit once you've tasted the authentic, real thing. And the counterfeit can look really attractive. The devil works overtime to make the counterfeits look attractive. And again, that was a big part. Uh, there's another man named Isaac Petrie who spoke on, uh, well, I don't even remember. I guess it was Friday night, yeah. And he talked about the warfare that goes on about our image. Like the biggest uh, weapon that the enemy has is the fear that we have about our own inability to follow God. And when you break off that fear, you become stronger. And he even quoted me uh, from a few weeks ago. He didn't know he was quoting me. But I had spoken about the anointing breaking the yoke. I don't know if any of you remember that. But I saw a version in the Bible where the yoke didn't just get broken off by God, but the yoke got broken off because he makes us so much stronger and we get so more bigger and puffed up that the yoke breaks off because of the increased anointing in our life. And he was quoting me. I wanted to just stand up and say, hey, man, that's right on, you know, go on our website. It's all, it all belongs to God, amen? It's all good revelation. It's such a great picture for me to keep in my head that it's not that the enemy is so strong. It's that God makes us stronger, right? If, if your immune system is weakened, a bacteria could hurt you. But when God strengthens your immune system, you could be in the presence of that sickness and it doesn't affect you. So that's what we keep praying, Lord, more of your power working in my life. So Adam and Eve have this perfect relationship with God. They're naked and they're not ashamed. God can 
uh, communicates with them on a regular basis. And, and what I want you to do is to just think about 11.59, not, not 12, or what, what are we at, like 1, 1 in the morning right now. At 11.59, when he returns, we're going to have that same perfect relationship with God again. That's part of what's going to be restored to us, is that we're going to be naked and unashamed. We're going to have no sin. There's not going to be any death. That We're going to live forever with God, and we're going to have a job to do. We don't know what the job is yet, but this life is a preparation for what's going to happen in the life to come. That's really exciting to me. So when you think of the garden, just remember that that's our future destination, not just a past memory of what they had. It's what we're going to have. And then the warfare came in, and that's what I started to say, right? The warfare came in when Adam was not tending to his wife, he was out of the garden somewhere, and the snake comes, the serpent comes, and starts to speak to Eve. And what did he say? Say it out loud. Did God really say, right? Now, how many of you have had that voice in your head? <laughs> it's not the Holy Spirit, is it? It's the tempter. It's the accuser of the brethren who said, did God really say? And, and you know, he's painted this way in the Bible as an attorney who's bringing charges against you. He's the accuser of the brethren. And, and the problem is that some of the things he says are true because we are not perfect people. We make mistakes, and he can get legal on us. And if we don't know who we are in Christ, and we don't say, yeah, but, Satan, that penalty has already been paid. My record has been expunged by the blood. <laughs> the jail door opened up, and I was given a reprieve by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of my testimony, by loving my life not even unto death. We overcame you, Satan. You have been cast down, Satan, it says in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 10. Look it up. Memorize that one, because when he's coming at you, see, she didn't know this. She was being beguiled, and he said, she, he said to her, basically, I'm summarizing, God is stingy. Yeah, you can have from all those other trees, but why won't he let you have from this tree? And that's what the devil just always tries to do, get you to think that God's stingy. He's holding out on you. He, the devil will say, he doesn't want you to have the knowledge of good and evil because then you'll be like him. And you know, if you tell a child that you can have everything in the kitchen except the cookies in the cookie jar, <laughs> where are they going? <laughs> right to the cookie jar. You ever see the film of the little kid? He's sitting at a table and they're filming him, right? It's an experiment. And they put a marshmallow on the table. And they say, listen, I'm going to walk out here for a few minutes, but if you can wait till I come back, you can have two marshmallows. But if you eat this one, you can't have the second marshmallow. I'll be right back. And they leave. And now they're filming the kid. And he's turning his back on it. You know, and he's looking at it. And he's touching it. And he pulls a little piece off, and then he turns it upside down. So that'll be on the bottom so that they won't see it. And he's smelling it. Oh, my God, it's the most amazing picture. You can look it up online. There's millions of hits. Because it's what sin does. It's very tempting. One kid didn't even hesitate. He, before the lady got out the door, he stuck the whole thing in his mouth. <laughs> right? And, and some of them waited. And, but, but nobody was, was without being really tempted. So now all of a sudden, Eve is just like, she, there's this thing. A, a seed of doubt has been planted in her heart about the character of God. So just be careful. Because that could happen to us, can it? I'm serving you. I'm doing everything they told me. I've gotten prophetic words, and I'm not seeing it come to pass. Maybe it's not really true. And that's exactly what the devil wants you to believe. So I said it a few weeks ago. Do you remember I said it wasn't an apple? What was it? I think uh, she, she turns around, and she reaches up on that branch, and she just pulls one of them off. And whether she was like the little boy with the marshmallow or not, I don't know. But she pulled off of that. And she ate it. And then Adam came back, and he ate some too. And it says their eyes, their eyes were open. And the first thing that happened when their eyes were open is they knew they were naked, and they were ashamed, so they hid. So maybe there's something about the knowledge of good and evil that's a two-edged sword. And maybe when Satan tempts you, it's usually got a two-edged sword to it, and you can't see the sharp edge that's going to cut you back. You just see the part that looks so tempting. God's holding out on me. He's really robbing me of, of fun that I could be having. No, he's not. He knows what's better for you than what your flesh knows. 
And all of a sudden now God comes into the garden and he realizes, and now we're at two o'clock. Sin has come into the garden and they fall. And at three o'clock on your calendar, it says death. Now they didn't die, but they brought death into the garden. And that was never God's intention. And as a pastor for 20 years now, uh, going on 21 years, people have come to me and, and some of the hardest things is, if God's such a loving God, why do so many terrible things happen to people, right? And, and all you have to do is go back to the book of Genesis and realize when they ate, when, when she picked that fruit off and, and disobeyed, she brought a curse on humanity. And that opened up a war, right? Anybody fond of a war? No, nobody likes it, but it's the reality of what we face. It wasn't his plan for us. If they had been obedient, we'd have had a whole different world, but we are at least in the new dispensation where Jesus came and died and delivered us from that sin that we had, and now you have Holy Spirit on the inside of you to live a life that's empowered by the same power that's going to fully empower us when we're with him forever. But, but three o'clock's a bad time, isn't it, on this clock? Because it then led to four o'clock, and what does it say at four o'clock? And, and you know, the wages of sin is, that's in the book of Romans, right? But that's the same principle here. Death came in the garden, and now all of a sudden an angel stands in the garden with a sword and says, you can't come back in the garden, Adam and Eve. You're going to have to leave the garden. And we've been wandering and trying to figure it out and co-labor with God if we're a Christian. But if you're not a Christian, you're just like, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're going to die. And the, and the world has a whole different set of rules than what God tells us to do. God says, treat other people the way you'd want to be treated if you were them. The world says, do unto others before they do it unto you. Big different, isn't it? They're going to rip you off, so you might as well rip them off first. You do it to them before they do it unto you. What a hard way to live. What a hard way to live in every situation that you go into to decide, should I cheat, shouldn't I cheat? What a power to have this word hidden in your heart so that you won't sin against God. And if a temptation comes, you've already made your decision. You already know you're not going to do that thing. You've already decided, as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. So I got a whole bunch more bandwidth available than the people I work with because they've got to decide in every situation. Well, am I going to get caught? Maybe not. If I don't get caught, maybe I should do it. And that's called situational ethics. <laughs> Another lie of the enemy. The devil's just saying, you won't get caught. You can get away with it. You're on a business trip. Your wife will never find out about this. Oh, man. Like sheep being led to slaughter, right? They're, they're walking into a noose of the enemy, and he's going to choke them and kill them and lead to death of relationships and death of trust. And God said, no, I got a better way for you. You do it my way, your life's going to go a whole lot better. So, but they were separated, and then we see this time at 5 o'clock on the clock, which is a period, a long period of time of multiple covenants. I'm not going to do, do the teaching on that. I spoke about it two weeks ago about different covenants, right? We know that God made a covenant with Noah. We know he made a covenant with Abraham. He was in, in covenant with Moses, and he told Moses how to build the tabernacle. And I said it two weeks ago that I, I believe what I read from another commentator is that God actually brought Moses up into heaven. And Moses saw what the tabernacle of heaven looks like. And, and the pattern that I give you, Moses, is going to be just like the one in heaven. You're going to recreate it on the earth, and it's going to be right in the middle of your camp. And in the middle of the middle of your camp, there's going to be something called the mercy seat. And the high priest is going to go in there at 6 o'clock <laughs> on your clock here, and he's going to make a sacrifice for sins. That's going to be representative of one man bringing in a sacrifice for all the people's sins. But that's not fully perfect, is it? Because every year, the priest had to keep going back in there and doing it. And that's the part of the treadmill of life. When I teach on uh, marketplace ministry, one of the big things we're going after is the spirit of mammon. We're talking about Passover now, right? The, the Jewish people come out of Israel, and before they came out, what was one of the rules that Pharaoh put into place? Do you remember? More bricks, no straw. <laughs> If you want a picture of mammon, that's what it looks like. More bricks, no straw. You're going to have to figure out a way. I don't know if this bears witness for you in your job situation, but where I worked, 
up till last May. I'm still in the same industry. I'm just not at the same company. But it's a big, well-known company that you've heard the name of. And it's brutal. The, the, the culture at the work is more bricks and less straw. You think technology is helping make life easier? Not helping. You just have no excuse. You're not allowed to turn your phone off. <laughs> so if they text you at 3 o'clock in the morning, they want an answer at 3.01, right? And now it's not quite that extreme, but it is kind of almost that extreme because no matter how much you do, they're always going to compare you to somebody who did more. And that's a losing strategy, isn't it? God says, oh, another great teaching was from a doctor uh, yesterday morning. Do you remember? I don't remember her name, but it's up on the website for Glory of Zion. She's a medical doctor, and she wrote a book on the power of rest. And she tied the word rest into restoration. And it's proven scientifically that you get more done when you rest. Okay? So the very thing Pharaoh wanted, he was defeating with his own bad strategy. If he had let the people rest, they would have been even more productive. It's a proven fact. Well, obviously, because it's what God told us. Those are already proven facts, aren't they? So now we get to 7 o'clock, and that's a really exciting time. And what is 7 anyway? That's completion of a cycle, isn't it? And who is born? Yes, and that's what we celebrate at Christmas, and that's a great thing to celebrate that Jesus is born because light comes into the darkness. Yeah. And you ever notice that December 25th is right around the darkest day of the year when it comes to the amount of sunlight on the calendar? Yeah, that's, that's when the seasons change. It's the least amount of sunlight on our calendar. And at that time of the darkest time of year comes the brightest light that we're ever going to see. And there's this beautiful picture that he comes to David's tribe because David was what? As, what did he do for a living besides play the guitar? It was a harp, I know, but it was really a guitar. Just, just turn it sideways. God loves guitars. I'm just telling you, he does. He loves stringed instruments. He talks about it all the time. And, and of David's tribe, he was a shepherd during the day. And, and while he was watching the sheep, when he knew everything was good, he was writing psalms. And God just loves that. And then as he's writing psalms, a lion and a bear would come, and David would take that sling, slingshot and show the warrior side of his personality, foreshadowing Jesus, a worshiper and a warrior. And right in the same fields in Bethlehem where David was watching his sheep, Jesus is born where the sheep are born to the shepherds, seeing the light come into the sky, and hear the angels. Oh, man, what a great time of year that is. This time of year is even better. Coming out of the tomb is better than him coming down. His life was awesome, but when he came out of the tomb, that defeated death. And that's what God kept showing me, the hands of the clock going around and around. Not, 1201 was creation, then sin and the fall, and now we get this new dispensation where Jesus is born, and it says it very clearly in the book of 1 Corinthians and in the book of Hebrews that Jesus was the second Adam. That's interesting, isn't it? Then say Abraham was the second Adam. Then say Moses was the second Adam. All these amazing people that God made covenant with, only one could be the second Adam, and this was going to be the upgraded version. His name is Jesus, and that's our Lord. That's the person that we worship, right? Because he was God in the flesh. We beheld his glory. It's, well, that's what we started with, right? The very first text that we read was from John. It's right still in front of me. I don't know if you guys have it, but you can go back there for a minute. He came to his own people. Can you just go back one slide? Yeah, there it is. Verse 11, see it? He came to his own people, and even they, what? Rejected him because they didn't know what they were looking for. They were expecting a general of the army to defeat the Romans. And this was a humble king. This was a servant king. And it was too far outside their paradigm. But who did recognize? The sinners, the tax collectors, the broken people of society. When David was on the run from Saul, who came to him at the cave of Adullam? Do you remember? All the outcast people, the criminals, the thieves, 400 people showed up. And they were all like they had just been let out of jail. And God said, these are your mighty men, David. <laughs> This is how you're going to be king. And Jesus said, you know what? The things that are important to the world are an abomination to God. God looks at the outside. We look. I'm sorry. Man looks at the outside. Jesus would say, me and the Father and the Holy Spirit look at your heart. 
and these broken people in the culture became the birthing of the church. Awesome, isn't it? No matter where you are on the hierarchy, he got born in a field, not at the Hilton. He can relate to the lowest rung of the society. When you do it to the least of these, he said, my brethren, you're doing it to me. It's not upward mobility in the kingdom. It's downward mobility. Yes. Oh, no freedom like that freedom. So the second Adam comes, that should tell us something. That what the first Adam couldn't do, the second Adam is going to do. <laughs> and he's going to set a model for us. So that dirt that God breathed into the first time got defiled by sin. Now Jesus lives and he's a new form of dirt because he was human. Son of man and the son of God. But he makes it all the way to 7 o'clock. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, 7. I got I got to tell, tell my own time on my own clock here. You came up with it. It's actually 8 o'clock that I want to go to. And it says he's pinned to a tree. And I purposely use that word, pinned, because of that picture that I shared a couple weeks ago, where she goes on this side of the tree, and she pulls the grape off and eats it, right? And that was the meal that brought sin in. And then he goes on this side. And he decides to get pinned back up on the cross, right? And that cycle of something coming off now gets completed by him getting pinned back up as the sacrifice. And, and he's not fully done with the cycle yet because he hasn't resurrected. But the picture of the second Adam is the first one failed on this side, but the second one is completing the cycle here and coming full circle. Why it was a great. See? What did they offer him? Sour wine. <laughs> Wouldn't it be sour? Because that's sin. What did he turn the water into at the wedding? What was the first miracle he did? Like all your mess, I'm going to turn it into something good. I'm going to take what, what was trying to kill you and give you life from it. But the story doesn't end there, does it? Because he's still on the cross. That wouldn't, got, that wouldn't have got us in. It got us his blood. I mean, we got a huge amount of reactions on one of our posts on Facebook because all I did was, was quote a scripture and put a picture of Jesus hanging on a cross, and there's like hundreds of people responded. Most of the time, they'll just say amen. But then other times, people will say, you know, it really spoke to me, man, that picture, something about that picture. Well, it's not our picture. It's just him. It's what he did for us, that he made a way for us into the holy of holies through a new and living way. That's a Hebrews. Through a new and living way, his body was broken open so that we could have access through his body through the, to the cross. So the cycle's not totally done yet, though. He's only on the cross. Then what do they do? They take him down off the cross, and this is now dead dirt. Just like Adam was dead dirt when he sinned. Now, he brought death, but this is dead dirt that has never sinned. And what happens? They bring him into the tomb, and all of a sudden, God breathes again. So just like God breathed the first time for the first Adam, and life came into Adam, now God breathes again, and life comes into the dead body of Jesus. And this time, this second Adam does not fall into sin. So the very thing God wanted from the beginning was the second Adam, a man who lives his whole life with no sin, and now you have access to that. That should get you really excited because that's why we were singing it over and over again. Because he lives, I can live today. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you and me. Look at the person next to you. Say, wake up. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you. What are you complaining about? <laughs> you got him living in you. I mean, not a low-voltage little 9-volt battery either, okay? This is not some little low-voltage char. I don't know about you. Did you? I have a battery in my guitar, and sometimes I take it out because the red light comes on. Ever do that? <laughs> to see if it's got, got a charge in it? I won't kiss Trisha after I do that, I promise. <laughs> but, you know, if there's a little bit of charge left, you feel a little tingling. No Christian is ever supposed to live like that. We're not connected to low voltage. We're connected to the nuclear power source. 
That's who lives on the inside of you. Why would you go to the counterfeit when you got the real deal? We're at, not, at, at we just finished eight o'clock. He got pinned, but now all of a sudden he's resurrected. God breathed on Jesus. God breathes on you and me. And that's what the celebration is about. That's what we are more excited about than Christmas. It was awesome that he came. But if the cross was it, if, he, if that was the last chapter and he didn't raise from the dead, this is what Paul says, your faith is in vain. Without the resurrection, your faith means nothing. He defeated the thing the enemy used against us is death. Oh, death, where is your sting? It's been defeated. But it's still not done yet. Because he has to go somewhere. Remember, he meets Mary, and I, and I told you, if you get a chance to go down to Sight and Sound and see this play called Jesus, it's so powerful. Mary Magdalene is the one that beats him in the garden, right? She's the same one that had seven demons cast out of her. Do you see again the theme? You see it's downward mobility. Find the most broken people, and he's going to turn them into generals in the army. She had more faith than the apostles had. She believed when she saw him. She's the first one to see him. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? That he doesn't hold rank the way we do. We don't put, he doesn't put people in a stratifi stratified thing. I'm going to respect this one more because he has a higher education level or makes more money or drives a nicer car. It's about the heart. And her heart was so exploded with love. To whom much is forgiven? Man, she loved much. What a place of honor Mary has. A former prostitute. God doesn't care. He cares about your heart. He'll restore your innocence. Everything that was defiled. You know, it's like he hangs out at the, at the drain. You know, sometimes it gets a little nasty in your sink, and you've got to pull that drain thing out, and you're like, ooh. And you just dump it in the trash, and then you go wash it off. That's who he loves. That's where he goes. He goes after, the, that's where I was. How about you? That's where I was. You were there too, right? I was telling him. We were in the drain next to each other. I was telling him, I know. Don't rat me out, bro. You got some bad stuff on me. I told you, Jerry Coffin was a junkie in the Bronx on, on, on Grand Concourse. He's a Jewish guy, going to die of heroin. He walks into a Spanish Pentecostal church, doesn't speak Spanish, and he got saved. <laughs> it was totally the spirit of God. Turned into this mighty man of God. He had a big church right there on Grand Concourse. The prostitutes were walking outside the church door, and he would let them in, and they would get saved. And no, any religious people in there would say, oh, well, they shouldn't be coming in here you can't even say dressed like that because they weren't really dressed. That was half the problem, right? And he's like, well, what do you think, that they're going to get cleaned up and then come in? No. By the way, you look like that to God, too. It might have just been a different sin. But as much as you're turned off by their sin, he was turned off by yours. So who are you? You living in a glass house? Don't throw stones. <laughs> Heard that expression, haven't you? So what does he have to do? Because she sees him, and he says, don't touch me yet, because I have to do something. Do you remember? What did he say? I have to go to my father. I haven't gone yet to my father. What was he going to do when he goes to the father? It's right on your clock. You can cheat. It's an open book test. Why would he have to go to the father with his blood? Because you don't complete the cycle until the sacrifice is finished. And he had to put the blood on the mercy seat in heaven. The one that Moses saw when God pulled him up there and God said, this is what I want you to do on the earth. Jesus had to take his blood. It's in the book of Hebrews in chapter 10. If you want to study this, let me tell you. Read it in the Passion Translation. It will change your life. Why he would do this. You know, like he said, it says the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross. Did you think you could ever be the joy that was set before him? Peter Roselli, like the one most likely in high school, you remember, the most likely to succeed, the most likely to be in jail by 19 
right? That was me. And now you're a pastor? What are you kidding? What kind of scam are you running? <laughs> this is New Jersey. That's what they think. They just can't believe your life could change. How many believe it can? And look at, I love 11 o'clock, man, because after he puts the blood on the mercy seat, he said it to them before he left. He said, you know, it's actually good that I go because once I go, the comforter can come. How many have been comforted by the Holy Spirit? There's nothing like it. You see how this cycle works? Because I got another news for you here, another news flash. This wasn't just Jesus. This is the cycle of our lives, too, because we still deal with stuff as Christians. Big news flash. Christians can have anger problems. People can still look at pornography and call themselves a Christian. Come on, where, how far you want to go on this one? There's a whole bunch more examples we could give, right? But the point is, just because you're a Christian and you're in doesn't mean you've been fully transformed. So this process of death, burial, and resurrection doesn't stop when you get saved. You gain victory over everything the enemy tries to use to lie to you. You gain victory over that if you're willing to keep doing this clock. If you're willing to keep going through this cycle. You recognize the sin. You repent of the sin. You ask the Lord to come in and help you where you haven't been able to do it. He said you have to crucify yourself daily. Oh, I wish that wasn't in there, don't you? Daily. What? Daily? Yes, every day. Can I get a different interpretation? No, it says daily in every single one. But look who comes to help us. The Comforter comes. He puts the blood on the mercy seat on the day of Pentecost, which is only 50 days from today. Seven sevenths. Get it? Seven sevenths. Where would we be without a Holy Spirit? I would just be doing it in my own flesh, in my own strength. That's what religion does. Doesn't have the oil of the Holy Spirit. And then what's at, what's at 11.59 and 59 tenths of a second? New creation. Look at the person next to you and say, that's you. You are the new creation. Ed Pamponi, new creation. You could do a little selfie. Do a little selfie. Point at yourself. New creation. New creation. That's who you are. I'm almost done. I just got to do this, okay? Bear with me. I have to read Isaiah 53. When we get together, we have to read Scripture out loud, okay? The cycle has been completed by Jesus. The death cycle was broken. And, you know, this happens, too. On Facebook, they'll respond. We'll put stuff up like this, and people will say, oh, uh, like one of them, I was talking about marketplace ministry, and it was obviously uh, an unbeliever. He said, oh, it's not good to bring imaginary friends to work. <laughs> oh, this is the kind of stuff we get. And that's just a wide-open opportunity to go back at that person with a good answer, isn't it? But not in a hateful way, because you were that person once, weren't you? So somebody else said, uh, I, one of the things I said on the particular video was the death cycle has been broken. The cycle of death that was initiated by Adam and Eve, the second Adam, defeated death when he came out of that tomb. And this guy wrote, what do you mean the death cycle is broken? People are dying every day. It's a good answer, right? If you don't know the Lord, that would be what the natural mind would think. So no, well, we come back with an answer and we say, yeah, in the natural it's true, but I like what Jesus said to Martha. If you believe in me, you will never die. But by the way, the people who don't believe in him are never going to die either. They're just going to spend eternity separated from God. And that should give us pause, shouldn't it? What would you do, Mr. Unbeliever, if you knew you were going to live forever and there's nothing you can do about it? Pretty scary, isn't it? What do you got to lose to try Jesus? Once the Holy Spirit, that's all you got to do. Just get him to read the book, right? That's happened to me. I was reading it to prove my mother was wrong. And she was like, I don't care why he reads it. As long as he reads it, sick him. Holy Ghost, sick him. Hound of heaven, sick him. Man, did he sick me. He locked on. 
Locked on. I'm sorry. I just want to read it. It's just too powerful. We can't ignore Isaiah 53. When you think about Easter, it should be about chocolate Easter bunnies, okay? This is the most important day on our calendar. It's the most important day in the history of the world. The cross was important, but coming out of the tomb is the most important thing that's ever happened. That gives us life. But look, this is hundreds of years before Jesus ever came. This is the picture Isaiah gets. Who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. This is so hard, isn't it? There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. You need to look at somebody and say this. He was beaten so we could be whole. Oh, he was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, whoo, that should be capitals, huh? All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, have strayed away. We've left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. This is hundreds of years before it happened, folks. You want a vision of a prophetic window into what's happening? Isaiah just got a window into heaven. And he's describing it as a sheep is silent before the shearers. He didn't open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants. How many are his descendants today? <laughs> Abba Father, you adopted me into your family. But in the natural, it looked like his seed, the fire had gone out. He had no natural descendants. But he sure has a supernatural bunch of descendants in us, doesn't he? <laughs> Nobody cared that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong, had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal and put in a rich man's grave. Who would that be? Joseph. This is hard, isn't it? Yet it Please the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. Somebody be happy about that. That many might be you. Yes, it is. It's us. For he shall bear our iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great. He shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sin of many and made transgression for transgressors. Oh, I couldn't believe that was in the Old Testament before I got saved because I was Catholic enough to know the story about Jesus being crucified. I had no idea Isaiah saw that picture all those years before. But I also didn't know David had a similar picture, and that's in Psalm 22. I'm almost done. But you have to realize Jesus was the son of David. There's no small connection here. And David gets a window into the crucifixion. I'm only giving you a small piece here. It says in Psalm 22, 7, Jesus is obviously the one David saw. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their heads saying, is this the one who relies on the Lord? Then let the Lord save him. If the Lord loves him so much, let the Lord rescue him. Yet you brought me safely from my mother's womb and led me to trust you at my mother's breast. I was thrust into your arms at my birth. You've been my God from the moment I was born. Don't stay so far from me for trouble is near. No one else can help me. My enemies surround me like a herd of bulls, fierce bulls of Bashan. 
having hemmed me in like lions, they open their jaws against me, roaring and tearing into their prey. My life is poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like a sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They've pierced my hands and feet. They pierced my hands and feet. David said this hundreds of years before this happened. I can count all my bones. My enemies stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. It's a picture of the cross. Exactly what happened. David saw it. Isaiah saw it. What about you? Do you see it? Do you see yourself on the clock? Do you see yourself with the Holy Spirit power as a Christian? If not, you can have it today. He doesn't show favorites. Well, you guys don't know what I've been through. I did stuff God would never want me in his kingdom. How many would have said that? Yes. The ones who aren't lifting your hand just need revelation. <laughs> yeah, keep it real. Anybody too far away from God that his arm can't reach them? Nobody. The most broken people are the ones he loves. That was me. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. Praise the Lord, all you who fear him. Honor him, all you descendants of Jacob. Show him reverence, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not ignored or belittled the suffering of the needy. He hasn't turned his back on them, but has listened to their cries for help. That would be you and me. We can stand up for this because this is that saluting time. <laughs> this is the call that God has for your life. Amen. Right at the beginning, I don't have it on here, but it says, since we are surrounded by such a what? A great cloud of witnesses. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. You are part of a family. You're in the new body of Christ. You're, the, you're in the family of Jesus Christ. When you look at somebody and call them brother or sister, it's no joke. We have the same father. We're part of the same family. And we're here to help each other, aren't we? How many can get by on your own, just alone? Nobody's an island. You can't make it. you got to be connected in the body. Don't forsake the assembling together. Find out what your place is. Find out what your calling is. Don't put on Saul's armor and wear somebody else's armor. Find yours. That's where you're going to be most effective because there's some giants that need to go down. And you're not killing a giant with Saul's armor. Do this. They were doing this down there too. you got to have your slingshot. <laughs> I want my slingshot. He died so you could use your slingshot. And yours is different than mine. You could have used mine. I could have used yours. So, man, I'll tell you, look around you. This is an important army of people that are surrounding you right now. We're the body of Christ. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. Right? It's not my church, Peter, Tricia. It's his church. We have power to overthrow the gates of hell. Not in our strength, but in his strength. So again, this is from the Passion. It says, we must let go of every wound that has pierced us. And the sin we so easily fall into. Then we'll be able to run life's marathon race with passion. Could you just do a little prophetic act with me in your place? You're going to run life's doesn't say sprint race, does it? What is it? Remember Karen Wheaton? Remember Karen Wheaton with the football? All those years, man. All those years waiting for that word to come. It's a marathon. And how are you going to run it? With passion. I'm going to run this marathon race with passion and determination. For the path has already marked out, been already marked out before us. Ooh, this is good. Verse 2, come on. We look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus. And who leads us. Just go back for a minute, though, okay? Just look up and fasten your gaze on Jesus for a minute. Just look. 
You know, like, what did she want again? She was being tricked into thinking that this was going to be the, remember the knowledge of good and evil, right? That was it. Can't have that. We look unto Jesus, and there's a whole cluster of grapes here, right? You want to know the knowledge of good and evil? You just come to Jesus Christ. He got every answer that you're ever going to need. And it's an inexhaustible supply. You remember when they brought the grapes in from the promised land? They needed two guys with a pole? That's how much access you have to the kingdom right now. You keep your eyes firmly fixed on him. You keep your gaze. Oh, we can't rush past that one. Fasten our gaze onto Jesus who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward. Again, like that step forward. that We heard that all weekend at Glorious Zion. We're crossing over. We're coming out of Egypt, and we're crossing over. We're crossing through the Red Sea. The Egyptians are dying behind us in the Red Sea, and we're going into our promised land. So are you. Amen? Amen. His example is this, and this is what we, we quoted earlier. It said, for the joy that was set before him. But he says a little different here. He says, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his. <laughs> oh, man. I think we need to say it in the first person. Say it out loud. His heart was focused on the joy of knowing that I would be his. He endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. And we are seated in heavenly places, just like heaven. Amen? Woo, you want to go high in the Lord? Downward mobility. You want to find him? Find broken people. And as you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, the Lord says, you're not looking into the poor person's eyes. You're looking into the eyes of Jesus. They were looking for Mother Teresa one time. They had to give her some bad news. And the guy shows up at the monastery. And uh, she said, it was just Sister Teresa at the time. And they said, uh, I, I need to find Sister Teresa. I got a letter from the Vatican. And uh, they said, oh, she's not here. She's never here. Yeah. Well, where is she? We don't know. But if you go to the poorest section of Calcutta, find the worst part of the city, that's where she'll be. Like, I mean, what a reputation. What a reputation. The most broken. We're not looking for a church of a bunch of highbrow people. You don't have to fill out an application, and we'll get back to you. Don't call us. We'll call you. The most broken. Amen. By the way, who was that? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Me, right? And his heart, when he went to that cross, his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that I would be his. Woo. Hard to get your hands around, isn't it? Hard to get your hands around it. It's not Easter bunnies. It's the resurrection. It's the resurrection. It's the greatest day in the history of the world. And I just can't stop. Going to make him known, right? We're going to know him, and we're going to make him known. The same power... If you know him is in you, I can't close without offering somebody that might not know him that's here today. And you, you might know about him. You know, we know about George Washington and Ben Franklin. They were historic people. But Jesus is a historic person that you can know personally. He wants to know you. There's a famous painting. He's standing on, at a door and he's knocking, but there's no handle on the outside of the door. He won't force his way on in. You got to open the door. Anybody here want to open the door to him? Hallelujah. Always. I was in a church service like this before I said yes to the Lord, and I felt like my, my feet were nailed to the floor when I tried to get up. Because the man said, if you, if you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you get out of your seat and you come up to the altar, make a public confession. That he's your Lord. And I felt like my feet were nailed to the floor. The devil tried to nail my feet to the floor. 
I just took my shoes off and walked up there. See? God always makes a way. He always makes a way. Whew. That might be somebody here, church. So let's just pray together, okay? Let's just pray it out loud. You can repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the good news that I heard today. Not good advice. Good news. That Jesus rose from the dead. Took the punishment for my sin. Did it because he wanted me to be his. But the handle is on the inside. So I have to open the door to let you in. I repent of my sin and running away from you. I open the door to let you in. And I run toward you instead of away from you. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for taking the punishment that I deserved on your back and then rising from the dead and sending your Holy Spirit to fill me with your power. Fill me with your power, Lord, that I might serve you. I might know you all the days of my life and for eternity. I accept you as my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Somebody better be happy. Let me tell you what. There's no better prayer. You can say it a thousand different ways in a thousand different languages. But the prayer is only part of it. Stepping out of the seat, man, you might have to take your shoes off. You might have to ask a friend to go up here with you. But did anybody say the prayer for the first time? Didn't know the Lord before you came here? Would you come forward? Would you come forward? Amen. Somebody come up and pray with this man. Today's your day. Today's the day. Today's the day. There's no better day. There's a big book up in heaven. And his name just got written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And there's a big celebration. Big celebration going on. When one sinner repents, there's a big celebration. Let's not stop there. Anybody got a life controlling problem that's about to kill you? You in a room this big with this many people? Somebody might have been contemplating suicide. I'm not asking you to say that you were. You don't have to say anything. I'm just telling you, don't assume the person next to you just because it's praise the Lord that everything's okay. You might have a life-destroying problem that's trying to take you out right now. You might have something in, that's got you in its grip and you think you're going to die. You don't have to die. You don't have to die. There's no shame. Nobody needs to know. God knows that there's an issue. All you need is somebody to agree with you to break the yoke of that thing off your life. Don't be ashamed. Come to the altar. There's always room at the altar. I, I saw people just leaving packs of cigarettes up here. <laughs> man, it says right on the pack, man, this thing can cause cancer. Well, sin is a cancer. Get rid of that thing, amen? I'm not going to belabor it. God doesn't have to beg you to do anything. We got prayer. People here that will pray with you just like this man is receiving prayer right now. Could you stretch your hand towards him? Lord, we thank you for this man, for the courage to step out of those shoes, for the courage to step in front of this altar and say yes to you, Lord. We just pray that his heart is good ground to receive the seed of your word. The birds of the air are not going to come and steal this seed, but it's going to last for eternity. And he is going to lead many others to you, Lord. You're going to allow him to fulfill the calling that you had on him since he was in his mother's womb. Nothing short of exceedingly abundantly above all that he could ever ask or imagine in Jesus' name. We'll have prayer. 
And if you need prayer, you can come right up that aisle and we'll have prayer ministers here. I bless you to have an awesome holiday today with your family. It's holiday means holy day. Keep it a holy day. We'll see you next week. Love you all.